So today we're going to take a look at writing a man page. Now this is actually a very, very simple process, but there's a few things you do need to keep in mind to actually make sure your man page is useful. So if you're new to the channel, you know what to do and let's jump right into it. Now the first thing to note is that there are a couple of different ways to write man pages. All of them will be compiled down into what we're working with today, but you can do things like make man pages with Perl doc or with Markdown or with HTML and then convert them into what we're working with today. Now the problem with doing it through that method instead of just writing it in the native language we're working with is that if you have any compilation errors or anything that's not really compiling the way it should look in a man page, it's going to be very difficult to fix unless you know how to actually write in the style that you write for man pages. So we're going to be working directly with trough today, but you might see tutorials online about Markdown or Perl doc or anything like that. What we're doing though is trough because all of those in the end are going to be compiled down into trough. Now trough is a very, very simple typesetting language. There's a couple of implementations of it. We're just gonna be working directly with what the man pages require. So let's just have a look at an example that I wrote a while ago, or it's not really a while ago, it's kind of like a few days ago. So in my repos folder, I'm working on some man pages for a friend of mine. Uh, where is it, in Perl projects. So we have these files in here. So let's just pick one at random, like this CPU freck works. So this is what the actual code for the man page looks like. Now I'm gonna step through all of this, but let's just have a look at what it looks like when I run it through man. So the way you actually run any of these documents, so I'm going to actually CD into the directory, even though I don't have to, because obviously I could do this, just go repos, Perl projects man slash CPU freck. Now I could do that. The reason I'm not gonna do this, because that works just fine, the reason I'm going to CD in is just to show you a slight problem that happens with man and it happens with a couple other programs as well. Just something you're going to want to keep in mind. So we'll just actually CD in there, man. Okay. Now, the reason I want to do this is because if you write CPU freck right here, so with most things, this would work fine. But what it's going to do is actually try to look in the man path for it. So if you're in the current directory, what you also have to do is specify that you're actually looking in the current directory for it, not in the full man path for it. Now I'll show you what the man path is a bit later, but that's not important for right now. Just know that if you're in the same directory as the man page, you need to also specify that you're looking in the directory. So run that, and as we can see, this looks like a normal man page. Now I'll just move my camera over. Obviously it's gonna look a little different to yours because I have coloring on my man pages but this is how a man page normally looks. For example, let's bring up something like the man page for D menu. Now the only difference you're gonna notice here is that this actually has some options that have some arguments to them. Now the other one was supposed to, but I guess I'd forgotten to add that because if you look at it now, there's this der option that I just forgot to add up here. Now I guess we can actually do that in here, but we'll get to that in just a moment. So. The important thing to remember about man pages is that you can actually technically write it however you want. So you could just have one massive block of text. Now I'm going to say that you shouldn't do that and there's a very good reason for that. So the reason that man pages are actually useful is because they are all formatted in the exact same way. So if you want to find something, you know that say the options are going to be in the options section. The description will be in the description section. So if you did just one massive wall of text without doing any of the normal formatting, technically it's still a man page, but the reason man pages are useful is because they all maintain that format. So make sure you keep that in mind. If you're ever unsure about how to actually format a man page, go look at some of the man pages for the GNU utils. Don't look at man pages for some of the third party apps you might download because the reason I would say stay away from those is because some of them do slightly diverge. Like for example, if we have a look at the man page for, I think Kitty was a good example. Kitty does a couple of things that are non-standard. This is fine in here, but this part right here is the problem. So the way they specify the options, they use a more, um, what's this syntax? Chomsky normal form? I think that's what that syntax is from. But they use a slightly different syntax than is actually what you're supposed to use for a man page. Now it gets the point across, but it would be better if they just stuck with what you should normally be doing. So the way it should be done is the arguments should be this underlined thing. Now, as I've said, it's not critical, but if you want to do a man page properly, then you have to do it how other man pages are formatted. So let's just dive into how this actually works and the sections that are important, the sections that aren't really important. 
So the first thing we have in here is this TH. So I'll just bring up the man page in another terminal so we can just actually have a look at how that works. So this specifies this header right at the top here. So TH, CPU frec, that defines this right here. This one defines which section of the man page something is in, or which section of the man pages in general it's in. Most stuff you're gonna put in one. If you need to put in anything else, you should probably just look into what actually goes in those sections. I'm not gonna dive into that in this video, partially because I haven't really looked into it, partially because I think that's a dedicated video in and of itself. So most things will go in one, so normally you just put one here. This next thing is the date, so you do this in year, month, day format, with dashes in between it. Some people will use it for version numbers, the official way to use it is for the actual date of the last major change to the man page. And this last section, typically if you don't have anything to put in here, you'd write GNU or Linux. Then you do .sh, and then that'll make everything under it actually indent a little bit. So this actually does what you'd normally see in a lot of scripts that don't use man pages where they'll actually manually indent stuff. So this does all of that automatically for you. The nice thing you'll see about working with man pages is that a lot of the stuff that you do manually, if you're writing your own sort of help page just in a string, this does it all magically and it just makes it easier. Personally, I think this is way easier than just doing it the manual way, but that's just me. So the first section you have to have is the name. A lot of this stuff you don't need, but the first one you do need is the name section. So the name section, you have the name, and then you're supposed to actually escape the dash. So there's a difference between a minus and a dash in trough and in typesetting in general. So this will make it so it actually puts a minus in here. Now the reason you use a minus as opposed to a dash is because dashes will actually allow the line to be broken, whereas a minus will stop the line being broken. So it's just convention to use a minus instead of a dash. So you have the name, and then you have the full name. So if you have, say, a shortened down name as the actual name of the script, or say you've got a program like ST. So ST is the name of the program. Simple Terminal is the full name. So it's a bit more of a descriptive name of it, I guess. Then the next section we have in here is for the synopsis. So the synopsis section is basically how you actually use the script, or how you use the program. So the first thing we have in here is a bold version of the actual name of the program. So to do that, you do dot B and then put a space and then the actual text you wanna have there. So in this case, it is CPU frec. And then the rest of the lines are just all of the options. So each line here should be one option. So what we've got in here is square brackets. So that means the option is optional basically. Option is optional, yeah, that makes sense. And then what we do in here is there's actually a way to do a inline style. So dot B will make it so the entire line is bold. Whereas if you do backslash F, so backslash font basically, B or capital B it should be. So backslash F capital B, that will mean everything after this point will be bold. And then we've got backslash dash, which if you remember from earlier, will basically put a minus sign in there instead of a dash. So that means the line can't be broken on that point. And then I've got the actual option in there. So in this case, the option is H. And then after that, we're doing another font setting. So backslash F R. So what this one will do, will basically set the font back to regular mode or standard Roman character mode. So that, if you think of it as regular, it's a bit easier. I think technically it's supposed to be Roman, but regular is basically what it means. So what would we do if an option is also requiring an argument? So let's just have a look at how that works. So it's very, very similar. So we're still setting the font back to regular because we don't want bold and underlined font. But what we have to do now is backslash F I. So I means italics, but italics are rendered as underlined pretty much. And then what we do is just put in the name for the argument. So in this case, it's path. So this is supposed to be D, that's supposed to be path, then backslash F, Ah, okay. So let's just rerun this and see what it looks like. So now as we can see in here, we've got another option. So dash D and then path. So as we can see, it's actually very, very simple to add new options and arguments in here. It's just a little bit of a weird syntax if you're not used to it. Now the next section we need is the description section. So once again, we use .sh and then the name of the actual section. The other way you can do this is just put the name on the next line. So you can do it like this, this is perfectly valid. Same with like the B as well. If you don't put something on the line, then it's gonna take the next line as the argument to that option. But typically you're gonna put it on the same line, especially if it's really short stuff like this. So we've got the description section. Now what we do in here is once again, we have another 
bold version of the name. And then after that, we have the rest of the descriptions. So in this case, we have CPU freq displays the current CPU core frequencies. And that is basically shown over on this side as well. Now I'll just reload that so it doesn't break anymore. Then the next section you have to have is the option section. And then everything after this point is going to depend on the actual script itself. But the see also section is a very commonly included section. So we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. So once again, .sh options. Now we're seeing a new macro in here. So these are actually called macros. I think I've been calling them options throughout this video. They're actually called macros in the documentation. It's not too important, but they are called macros. So .tp, so what does this one do? Now, this is actually a very simple one. What it will do is it'll do nothing to the following line. And then the line afterwards, it'll basically put that indented another level. So that's how you get this special formatting that you've seen in a man page time and time again. Now you actually have to do something special when you're writing this line. I'm not really sure why this happens, but just this is how you do it pretty much. So we're gonna write the options out like normal. So as always, the dash, we're using a minus, so backslash dash, then list out the options. But between the options, what you have to do is actually put quotation marks and then a comma and a space. You could also actually just escape both of these if that's how you'd prefer to write it. This is also valid. This will do the exact same thing but I prefer to do it like this. I'm not really sure why you have to, but you do have to anyway. So I should have mentioned this earlier, but this .br option isn't actually a new macro we haven't seen. So this is actually a really interesting thing that trough can do. So if you go .br, what that's going to do is the first word is gonna be bold, the second word is gonna be regular, third bold, fourth regular, so on and so forth. So this is actually why this is quoted. So what's gonna happen in here is this first part's gonna be bold, and this comma and the space is gonna be then set back to regular text. So that's why that's like that. I completely forgotten about that. But basically that's why you have to have that in quotes. Also, if you don't have it in quotes, it's not gonna include the space just because of the way this line's set up. But that's, that's not too important. Just have it set up like this and everything will be formatted as it should be. Now the other thing you need to remember is to actually include arguments to any options you include in the options section. So you just include this at the end after all of the other versions of the option. So in this case for the dash D or dash dash der option, we have dash D is the first one, comma, dash dash der. And then at the end, what we're doing is backslash F. We're setting it to italics mode. So italics, if you remember, is basically underline. And then we just have the value there. So that's what this is doing over here. Now, as I said, the rest of these sections are kind of optional. Most of them you don't really need. The only one you typically see is this C also. So the way we do this is .sh C also, as we've seen plenty of times already, and then backslash F B, and then the name of the man page that you're referencing, backslash F R, and then in brackets, the section the man page is in. So if we have a look at the man page for D menu, I think it has, a couple. So if we go down to see also, now this is where you're going to see that some of the man pages don't follow the same formatting style. So this one uses underlines, whereas I'm using bold. And the reason that I use bold is because if we go to, for example, the man page for apropos, which is one of the programs actually works with man. So I'm going to assume that the man page is written correctly. So if we go down to see also, this has it in bolds instead of underlines. Now, I'm gonna assume that if it's the documentation for a program that hooks into man, then it's going to be correct. Like, let's have a look at the man page for man. Does that also have it? See also. Does it have it? Yes, it does. Okay, in this one, it's also written with bolds. So presumably, bold is the correct way to do it. But there's plenty of programs that do it the other way. I'm just gonna assume that this is the correct way though. So the sections a man page needs to have are basically the name, the synopsis, the description, and the options. Everything after that is optional and will depend upon what you're actually doing. Like sometimes you're going to omit the file section or the author's section, or sometimes you need to add sections that aren't standard. And in those cases, make sure you're still formatting it in a way that makes sense for the man pages. Like say, for example, let's just go back to ST. Actually, I didn't show that earlier. Let's go to ST. But as we can see, shortcuts isn't a standard section, but it's formatted in a way that makes sense for man pages, basically. 
So for non-standard sections, make sure they actually fit with the same sort of styling that a man page has. Now the last thing I wanted to mention is about man path. So I did mention this earlier, but you might wonder where are my man pages actually being stored? And if we run man path, so I'll just look at the man page for man path. This basically will determine the search path for the manual pages. Nothing too special about it. So we run this and it will basically just output a path variable. Now, as we can see, there's a couple of different locations in here. So it'll depend on your distro. On Arch, this is where they're stored at least. So we have user local man, user local share man, and user share man. So I believe most of mine are in user share man. So I'll just show you that one. Share man. And we go into LF. And as we can see, all of the man pages are in .gz files. Now, I'm not really sure why. I, I haven't really found any documentation online about why they're all gzip files. So if someone wants to know why they are, I, I don't have an answer for you. But I guarantee someone in the comments is going to let me know and tell me why I'm so dumb for not knowing. But... I'm going to assume it's probably just to save space on systems that don't have very big hard drives. That seems like a sensible reason to do it. But if there's some other reason why it's set up like that, feel free to let me know and I might pin your comment or something. So I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about in this video. I think so, yeah. If there's anything you're not really sure about for styling a man page, go look at the man pages for other programs that already exist. Obviously, be careful when you are looking at certain types of programs because, as I showed earlier, not every program follows the styling properly. So, for example, Kitty doesn't style it properly. It actually uses the name section for stuff that shouldn't be in the name section as well. I didn't spot this earlier. This should be in the synopsis section and this should be in the description. But for some reason, they feel like putting everything under name. I, I don't know why. So, just keep that in mind. When you are looking for how to write a man page, a good place to look is generally going to be core utils because core utils, I presume, are going to be written in a way that, you know, fits the style guide. And if they're not, I'm going to be very confused why they're not. So I think that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. So if you like this video, remember to smash that like button and leave me a comment down below letting me know what you think. If you want to see more videos like this, remember to subscribe and ding the little bell icon down below because it'll really help the channel out. I'm now aiming for 10,000 subs and any help would be really appreciated. Up on that corner, I've got the playlist this video's in. So go check that out if you want to see other videos like this. Down below, I've got my social links, so my Discord and my Telegram. So if you want to chat with me or get video updates, then you can go to those places for that. I've also got my support links down below. So if you want to go donate to my Patreon or any of the other donate links down below, feel free to check those out. But obviously, if you don't want to, then you don't have to. But any help will be really appreciated. And lastly, I've got my alternate video platform, so my BitTube and my library. So feel free to check those out if you want to see my videos on a platform that isn't YouTube. So I think that's pretty much everything for me, and I'm out.